Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Salman from Scholar School System. I'm a lecturer in business studies. Today, I'm going to deliver the module of Introduction to Business Operations and Management with the module code BMM3003. So, what's going to be our topic today? Last week, in our last lecture, we have discussed the concept of management and also the different type of the organizations in terms of structuring so different types of organization structures have been discussed and later we have discussed human resource management today with respect to the topics we have discussed before we are going to analyze some cases they will be about the organizational structures the types of the organization structure but before doing that what I'm going to do I will summarize the, the the previous discussions so the first question how are businesses organized here organizing refers to the structure of the organizations what I mean in order to understand all aspects and dimensions of this management concept, I would like to start by management. What is management? Management is the process of achieving organizational objectives by using organizational resources and through with people. So in this process, there are something to be regarded. First, this includes all the activities to accomplish organizational objectives on the other side in order to achieve these organizational objectives you need to have some resources and people as well according to the some scholars the management is simply guiding people or directing people so you need people in in the management activity or management process and we have some functions under the management what are those functions planning organizing directing or staffing and directing later and controlling what is planning planning is the process of setting organizational objectives and based on the objectives identifying the organizational mission vision and objectives so that's all you need to outline the major tasks subtasks and how to perform those outline tasks in an organizational context planning function after making after completing the planning function the next thing is organizing now organizing is the concern of this chapter because in organizing function we are supposed to allocate required resources to the various group in organizational contexts. So what I mean, I mean that first we need to define the level of the hierarchy in the organization. What level of the hierarchy will be outlined in this organization? In some of the organization, you will see that the hierarchical levels are very high these kind of organizations are called as tall organization as the number of the hierarchy or hierarchical levels are more than the others but in some of the organizations the level of the hierarchy less than the others if let's say just one level of the hierarchy and then at the bottom of the organization there, there are only the operators or employees or subordinates. This is flat organization. So we, have, we may differentiate the organizations with respect to the level of the hierarchy in an organization context. And but in a most common way, we differentiate the hierarchy in an organization at three levels. What are the levels? At the top of the organization, there's a top management. At the middle level of the organization there's a middle level management and at the bottom of the organization 
that is a top a bottom level of the management or the first line managers now what are the responsibilities of each level of the hierarchy at the top of the organization top management is engaged with strategic decisions and strategic planning of the organization at the middle level of the organization it's the middle level management takes the intermediary role and that's why it connects bottom level of the organization with the top of the organization so they are the departmental managers engage with the departmental decisions or departmental processes and at the bottom of the organization there are operational managers like foremen supervisors or unit managers okay. so they are engaged with the daily operations and operational decisions the first line managers or bottom level management and in organizing function and we do something more what do we do we outline the level of the authority for each position let's imagine that at the top of the organization what will be the level of the authority and most of the organizations are outlining level of the responsibility for each position properly but if you are allocating any responsibility to anyone you need to allocate corresponding authority as well otherwise the person and is in a position will not be able to accomplish the assigned tasks if he or she does not have a proper and or level of authority that's why in um, organizing function we do also location of the responsibilities and authority okay. or corresponding authority and the next thing in organizing function is about departmentalization what I mean by the departmentalization and actually it's our main concern in today's lecture organizing departmentalization the departmentalization is done by vertical and horizontal and dimensions vertical means in a specific department let's take the marketing department in marketing department there is a different functions what I mean and for instance advertisement promotion plays or distribution they are all different functions or different processes so you could have some sub departments or sub divisions or sub units and you know it's going to be how it's going to be vertical dimension on the other side at the same level of the hierarchy let's say that under the control of the CEO or president of the organization we have at the same level marketing finance accounting production research and development department as well so this is were at the horizontal departmentalization or horizontal dimension so we are doing departmentalization in organizing function as well with respect to those departmentalization and allocation of the authority and responsibility we define different types of the organizational structure what is the organizational structure organizational structure is the relationship among the functions within the organization what is the relationship between or what is the connection between an accounting and finance and marketing and finance in an organizational context this relationship or this connection could be defined differently in different organizations so depending on the approach of the organization to this departmentalization and this outline we call different type of the structure for instance the basic one or most widely known is the simple structure is a functional structure what's the meaning of the meaning of the functional structuring organization develops and establishes its departments based on the business functions so this is this means that under the top management mostly it is CEO okay of the organization we have functional departments such as what HRM accounting finance 
production, marketing, okay, research and development, public relations, blah, blah, blah. We have all the departments based on the business function. This is simple or functional departmentalization or functional structure. On the other side, we have a divisional structure. What's the meaning of the divisional structure? In divisional structure, if there is a corporation, a company has different type of the operations in different industries, what do you do? Let's say that on the one side, you are producing a car. On the other side, you are producing another type of the product such as computer. So you are differentiating your organizational structure with respect to the, these different industries. It might be division. Division is not only for the different type of the, type of the products. It might be also based on the location. For instance, uh, you are producing car in Europe and in the United States as well. So you can uh, differentiate your department and units based on the different locations. So it's going to be geographical structure. Yeah, you are still dividing it's the divisional structure, but the divisional structure is done based on the different geographies. This is a geographical structure. And what do we have is another type, matrix structure. Matrix structure is also known as the project-based structure. And in project-based structure or matrix structure, the employees come together as a team to accomplish or to finish a project. Okay, so they could have two managers in this type of the structure. There is no specific manager to guide them, but there might be two managers to give them a task. Mostly in order to build a team, the people come from the functional departments. So after completing the project, the team will be disbanded and they will come together for another project as well. This is matrix structure or project-based structure. But here, and in divisional, I would like to say about the divisional structure, the companies need to have some duplicated departments. Let's think that. You have a marketing department for car manufacturing industry, car manufacturing uh, business. On the other side, you have another marketing department for the computer manufacturing. Or you have an HRM department for uh, the car manufacturing division. You have also another HRM department for uh, the computer uh, manufacturing. So there is a duplication of the units or functional departments in divisional structure. In geographical structure, the geographical structure as well, there is a duplication. This is a disadvantage of this type of organizational structure. All right, so, and it really affects the effectiveness and the efficiency of the management system, organizing function. Okay. All right. The other functions of the management is staffing, leading, and controlling. Let me shortly define them. Staffing, as you know that, finding right person to accomplish, assign, and allocate tasks in planning and organizing function. Directing is about the influencing and convincing organizational members to perform their task. Okay? You need to encourage them, you need to motivate them. So directing function enhances this function. Finally, controlling function is the function to understand if the and develop objectives have been accomplished or not. How do you do that? At first, you outline the standards for doing that. In the end of the process, we measure actual performance and we compare actual performance to the standards. If there is a deviation between standards and the actual performance, the organization needs to take correct direction. So this is controlling function. If we come back to the organizational structure that facilitates the success of the organization, 
And today we are going to analyze the, some of the cases and we will be always understanding how organizational structure has an influence on organizational performance. Another topic that we have covered last week is about the, what is a manager. Managers, if you would like to give a simple definition, managers are the decision makers. Managers are the responsibility holders. With respect to the position of the manager in an organizational context, they will have the different level of the responsibilities. With respect to the, that responsibility, they will be allocated authority to make decisions. Let's assume that a marketing manager department, the, sorry, the marketing manager. Marketing manager is in charge of making decisions with respect to the marketing activities, such as advertisement, such as promotion, such as pricing, blah, blah, blah. But the top management, at the top management, you know, that based on the position, CEO, when the CEO make a decision, all the organization uh, is influenced by those decisions. But once the marketing manager had a decision, only the marketing processes will be influenced by this decision. All right, next thing was about the human resource management. Uh, human resource management, and uh, as you know, as a function, it is simply, and the uh, covering recruitment and, and selection process, but not only recruitment and selection processes are the under the responsibility of human resource management. What else? We know that employee security, for instance, or safety and health issues, and retention, retaining people in an organization. It's another effort of the human resource management. Remuneration or compensation, or performance appraisal, and training. Okay. They are all responsibilities of human resource management. Indeed, the motivational uh, concerns are under the responsibilities of human resource management as well. Okay. So, here we have recovered and we have done the recap of the previous week. Now, today we have two case studies and the one of them is about the Toyota. As you know, Toyota is one of the most and the best known auto manufacturing company all around the world. And they have several operations in different locations in different regions as well. And they are still going on to extend their operations all around the world. So what's going to be our case? Let me discuss this case first and I would like to clarify it and then we will be talking about uh, the details and what has been done in this organization in terms of organizational structure and then what is the reaction against it. Soyuz Motor Corporation um, has often been referred to as the gold standard of the automotive industry. In the first quarter of 2007, Toyota overtook General Motors Corporation in sales for the first time as the top automotive manufacturer in the world. Toyota reached success in part because of its exceptional reputation for quality and customer care. Quality and the customer care are the, the, the things that Toyota was good at doing that. Despite the global recession, and tough economic times that American auto companies such as General Motors and Chrysler faced in 2009, Toyota enjoyed profit, $16.7 billion, and sales growth of 6% that year. However, late 2009 and early 2010 witnessed Toyota's recall of 8 million vehicles due to unintended acceleration. How could this happen to a company known for quality and structure to solve problems as soon as they arrive? To examine this further, one has to understand about the Toyota production system. As you know, Toyota production system is built on the principle of just-in-time production. So it enhances to manage and the inputs and raw materials 
and also it eliminates this stock cost, cost of stock. In other words, raw materials and supplies are delivered to assembly line exactly at the time they are to be used. This system has little room for slack resources, emphasizes the importance of efficiency on the part of employees, and minimizes wasted resources. Toyota production system gives power to employees on the front line. Assemble, assembly line workers are empowered to pull a cord and stop the manufacturing line when they see a problem. So the employees in assembly line have been powered and empowered by the organization to stop the production line if they see any detect, if they see any fault in the system and in production. So it's a part of the quality control process. However, during the 1990s, Toyota began to experience rapid growth and expansion. With this success, the organization became more defensive and protective for information. Expansion strained resources across the organization and slowed response time. Toyota's CEO, Akio Toyoda, the grandson of its founder, has conceded, quite frankly, I fear the pace at which we have grown may have been too quick is sometimes the rapid growth might be a challenge for the organizations. So vehicle recalls are not, are not new to Toyota. After defects were found in the company's Lexus model in 1989, Toyota created teams to solve the issue quickly, and in some cases, the company went to customers' homes to collect the cars. The question on many people's mind is, how could a company hall whose success was built on its reputation for quality have had such failures? Think that the employees have the authority to stop the production line if they are able to see a fault, but this, this a big fault has not been recognized by any quality control assurance or any quality control officer and employees as well. So this was the question. And what is all the more puzzling is that brake problems in vehicles became appearing in 2009. But only after being confronted by United States Transportation Secretary Ray LeHood did Toyota begin issuing recalls in the United States. And during the early months of crisis, Toyota's top leaders were all but missing from public sight. The organizational structure of Toyota may give us some insight into handling of this crisis and ideas for the most effective way for Toyota to move forward. A conflict such as this has the ability to paralyze the productivity but if dealt well with constructively and effectively can present opportunities for learning and improvement. Companies such as Toyota that have a rigid corporate culture and hierarchy of seniority are at risk of reacting to external threats well. Now, this point is very crucial because this is the point that I want to discuss. Companies such as Toyota that have a rigid corporate culture in terms of quality and hierarchy of seniority are at risk of reacting external threats well. So there's a threat coming towards your organization, so you need to respond quickly, but you are not able to do that. Your organizational structure does not allow you to do this. Why? The question is why? And how to react against the threats the coming towards your organization? Now, we will talk about it. It's not uncommon that individuals feel reluctant to pass bad news up the chain within a family company such as Toyota. Toyota's board of directors is composed of 29 Japanese men, all of whom are Toyota insiders. As a result of its centralized power structure, I would like to underline this point, as a result of its centralized power structure, authority is not generally delegated within the company. All U.S. executives are assigned a Japanese boss to mentor them and no Toyota executive in the United States authorized to issue a recall. Most information flow is a long way back to the Japan where decisions are made. Very good. Now, this gives an us and the perspective on Toyota case. What's that? Toyota had a centralized mechanism, centralized organizational structure. 
What's the meaning of the centralizing? Most of the major decisions are made by a group of senior managers in this organization. So there is no delegation from top to bottom of the organization in some critical points. But some of the organizations are preferring to have a decentralized structure rather than being centralized. Decentralizing means in this organization, the people are more likely to delegate their authority from top to bottom. In that case, at the bottom of the organization, at the middle level of the organization, the people are encouraged to take initiative and responsibility for taking action. So it's, it gives a chance to organization to react quickly and against any reaction, against any change in the market, against any threat coming toward the company. That's why this is the, um, the pitfall, this is the disadvantage of the organization, the, the authority organization structure. And then what they have done, they have started to delegate their authority to the different branches in the United States. You now they have they have quarter in United States as well, and they have kept delegated their authority. And they try to involvement of the local executives or senior managers in their decision making board. So that's the point. For instance, you are delegating your employees. It's a good way indeed. But the question is this. At what level of the organization the people have authority to make a decision or to be involved in decision making processes? Yes. So decentralization could help Toyota to fix this problem. But how will you do this? In order to do this, first you should um, get people ready for that. How are you going to do that? If they need to be trained, you will be giving them training. If they need to gain more skills to make decisions, yes, as the company, you should provide skill gaining. Okay. So this was the Toyota case, and it was about centralization and decentralization. Decentralization and centralization is the choice was made by the organization. So, and it's a part of organizing function as well. Now we have another case. This is another car manufacturing organization. It is General Motor. Let me give you a brief on General Motor case. The General Motors and the, the trials and tribulations of the General Motors during 1980s and 1990s mirrored those of organizations in the United States and around the world. General Motors position of market leader in automobile production and sales began to falter in the early of 1980s along with the market leaders in the other industries. Competitive forces throughout the world were forcing US firms to rethink their strategies and their organization designs. As more and more competitors from Asia and Europe challenged General Motors market supremacy and a technological development in manufacturing and information processing challenge, General Motors production advantages, and General Motors management responded by implementing changes in its organization design that continue into the second half of 1990s. The first signs of problems began to appear in 1981, when the company reported its first loss since 1921. Imagine that. This is the first time company is announcing the loss since 1921. And this report coincided with the appointment of Roger Smith as CEO, the sixth General Motors CEO since Alfred Sloan Jr., who served from 1937 to 1956. Sloan created the modern version of General Motors through the development of the divisional organization structure which consisted of the five independent divisions, Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. There are five division structure. As we have discussed in the beginning of this lecture, division uh, structure is one of the uh, organizational structure. So based on the different model or different cars, now the General Motors has differentiated its structure. And 
The competing product strategy encourage each division to compete for customers by delegating complete authority to each division to design, produce, market, and sell its own particular line of cars. Each division has its own autonomy to design, to produce, to market, and to sell their product. They are competing each other under the same company. So, the only limitation placed on the division was the overall corporate strategy of encouraging car buyers to think of trading up as each year's new models hit the show floor. Thus, the Chevrolet division produced the starter cars, relatively inexpensive and within the price range of the first-time car buyer. But with increased income, the car buyer will be encouraged through promotion and selling efforts to consider the more expensive point check and Oldsmobile vehicles, and ultimately the Buick and Cadillac. The traditional divisional design was in place throughout the post-World War II period when General Motors grew into the largest manufacturing organization in the world. But something happened along the way. The divisional structure as it evolved over time began to be identified as an impediment to progress and market response. One of the outgrowths of the structure was development of a massive corporate support staff, which when created was supposed to provide expert advice and consultation to the divisions. But over the time, these staff members began to take over the decision-making of the line units and the decision-making began to grind to a halt in endless discussion, in endless committee meetings at corporate quarters. As they have employed more staff more senior managers, now this is becoming a challenge. In the literature, this is known as bureaucratic cost. As well as you employ more managers, even though it is not required strongly, it is called bureaucratic cost. You increase the number of the managers at the top, but you do not make any investment, you do not hire as well as the managers and the, uh, the employees in your organization. This is bureaucratic cost. You just increase the bureaucratic cost. Thus, when Roger Smith took the reins in 1981, he began to process that continues even to this day, redesigning General Motors organizational structure with the specific purpose of pushing decision making down into the operating divisions and reducing the number of the staff at corporate headquarters. Now, after being employed Roger Smith as the CEO of the organization in 1981, what's, what did he do? He and eliminated the people at headquarters of the organization. And then he delegated authority to the operational levels. Okay. In 1984, he announced his first move, the creation of two autonomous groups, BOEC and CPC. BOEC consisted of what had been the big Oldsmobile and Cadillac division, and CPC consisted of what had been Chevrolet. Pointiac and General Motor of Canada. Smith delegated complete authority to each of these groups to organize in whatever way the manager through thought was necessary to get General Motor back on track to regain its competitive, growing, and profitable status. BOEC decided to organize four completely autonomous product groups, strategic business units. Each product group would operate as Sloan had envisioned his divisional structure will operate exercising complete authority to design, produce, and sell cars. By contrast, CPC organized around functional lines with centralized authority, but with a matrix overlay to facilitate communication across company. Okay, here, what is the point? Instead of having a pure divisional structure, General Motor prefers to apply on the divide and organization as BOC and CPC. So there are two main divisional structures. But under these divisional structures, they have their autonomy, so they divide their organization with different structure. For instance, CPC is using a matrix overlay to facilitate communication, and but they have a centralized approach. In BOC, they have decentralized approach. They are delegating authority to the bottom of the organization. So the employees 
have flexibility to be involved in decision-making process. And they are encouraged to take initiative in decision-making mechanisms. All right, and so what happened? The new CEO, a new CEO has been uh, hired, and the new CEO responded to news that General Motors market share had dropped to its lowest point in 23 years, 29%. By creating a single operating division, it's North American operations, pairing corporate staff from uh, 13,500 to 2,500, and reducing the number of car models from 62 to 54, combining 27 different purchasing departments into one, and eliminating nearly 16,500 hourly jobs by offering early retirement. These seemingly harsh measures were necessary, according to the Jack Smith, to assure General Motors ready survival as an automaker. The organizational design that General Motors now counts on enable it to survive and complete identifies the five traditional divisions, Chevrolet, Poncia, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac as marketing units. So let's come to the question, what was it? Here identify environmental forces that have driven General Motors to change its organizational design. What was it? It was competition. In 1980s, due to competition, intensive competition in the United States, United States-based companies are being forced to change their organizational structure. In order to re react against the change in the market, in the industry, they need to change their centralized structures into the decentralized one. And the second question, have the changes in the structure been in the right direction? Have they been misguided? Explain your answer and reason. At first glance, we may think that, yeah, it was in the right direction. But in practice, it didn't work as it was expected. Why? After, you know, that the dividing structure into two parts what they have done by the uh, as a fault or a mistake they have employed more managers or more executive staff uh, at the headquarter of the corporation so it created highly centralized organization because all the decisions are made by the headquarter and as they hesitate to delegate their authority they had some problems and they have created a bureaucratic cost for the organization. And later what happened, later a new CEO has eliminated in 19, by the end of the 1980s. And then in 1990s, a new CEO eliminated all the divisions. And so it only created one uh, centralized uh, organizational division. Under this division, all the car manufacturing uh, facilities came together but and in some decisions it has been centralized and also they have created centralized departments such as for instance marketing marketing is done from a central department but the in terms of production they have their autonomy for instance in terms of design they have autonomy they do not need to have a centralized structure but in some functions in some operation they have the central approach okay the last thing is about um, uh, thinking about it the company plans to collaborate with Hindustan Motors whilst also trying to be independent what changes may happen to organization structure of the parent company now the parent company uh, no the cultural conflict may be arising and if there is a partnership with any, a different uh, originated company. So on the other side, there will be clash of the different structures. If there is on the one side, one of the companies operating with division structure, if other one is operating with functional structure, for instance, it could be another clash between the organizations. And in terms of communication, could be some issues. In, term of, in terms of constituting and building up a management team, in terms of senior management, and you can 
also imagine board of directors could be some inconveniences. So, and if there is a common principle, principles could be agreed by the two uh, sides, two part, and it could be eliminated. All right. Thank you very much for your listening and have a good day.